Uh, drive in from uh, from other cities, uh, but also we have a, about I don't know maybe a hundred and eighty thousand dollars worth of uh, uh, equipment in the building, and so we don't want to take an electrical hit uh, because we we don't want to we don't want to put that kind of money out to replace it. And so anyway, we're here tonight. We're going to pick up where we left off uh, last week in the book or the last session rather in the book of Genesis. Uh, just a, a quick review. God creates Adam uh, in the garden. Uh, prior to creating Adam, he, he creates everything that Adam would ever need. God worked for five days making sure that all of Adam's needs were fully met so that when Adam was created, the day that he was created, Adam had zero needs. He needed nothing. Everything was already in place. And then God made uh, from Adam's rib, he made a woman as a companion and a helpmate uh, for Adam. And they had one commandment, just one commandment. There's only one way that they could possibly sin. And that was to break the one commandment, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, they, they did eat of that tree. Uh, and we're going to pick up tonight, just after they ate of the tree, verse seven of chapter three, it says, and the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, it's funny because the scripture, when Eve partook of the fruit first, the scripture doesn't say anything really happened. It just, it, there's just a big hole there. It doesn't give us any information. It's not until Adam along with Eve partook of it, that's the whole of the human race at that time, that we get to, to this place. Their eyes were opened, and they knew they were naked. Now, they had never wore clothes. There was no such thing as clothes up until that time. But the partaking of that fruit, uh, it, as, as it was promised to them, it caused them to know good from evil. If you go back to, uh, let's see if I can find this. Well, I don't have it in my notes, but if we go, oh, yes, here it is. Go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. This is the temptation that, uh, that, that the serpent gave Eve. Verse 5, he said, For God doth know in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And as soon as they partook of the forbidden fruit, they had this knowledge of good and evil. Now, here's the problem with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Man currently, and we see this in our society, we have a sense of what is good, but it is completely divorced from what God says is good. Are you with me tonight? It, the two do not reconcile at all. For example, man in our current society says, well, yes, we have to legalize love. No matter who's in love, no matter what sex, no matter, legalize love. Love should be legal, right? That's good. But man's perception of what is good is altogether different than God's perception. And our perception of what's evil is also different. So it wasn't just that we, we came into the knowledge of evil. Even the good part of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil also had a separating impact, uh, separating man from God. They knew that they were naked. Now some uh, theologians think that Adam and Eve were it's swathed with light, that maybe they had, light was their covering. Some go so far as to say it was the glory of God that covered them. Uh, there's nothing in the scripture concerning it, but we do know that as soon as they partook of that fruit, they saw themselves differently. They saw themselves, they saw each other differently. And it caused a shame. They, they felt like we have to cover ourselves. There was a shame uh, inside of them Creation now could see them what they are, what, what they had become because of the fall. So they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now this is the first effort on Adam that we know of on Adam's part to make something from the, uh, from, from the material that surrounded him. And it took probably some ingenuity. He had never seen a garment before. He, there, this is the first one that, that has ever existed. 
And so the materials that were around were fig leaves. And so they, they took fig leaves and somehow they sewed them together and they made garments uh, to hang upon their bodies. And although it took some ingenuity to do that, uh, it, it wasn't very smart at all. Uh, fig leaves are, are thick leaves. They have a large water content in them. Uh, they're large leaves and, and mainly it, it's water that's within them. But as soon as you pull it from the plant, the water begins to dry out immediately. And the fig leaf, ever how big it is when it starts, it immediately begins to shrink down. And as the water continues to drain out of it, continues to evaporate, the leaf will become brittle and start to crack. And so it was a very short-term situation, uh, and it really is a type of, of how we look when we try to cover ourselves with religious facades, trying to be some, trying to cover up ourselves religiously. It has the same impact. It's not a covering uh, that will last. God looks right through it. So they, they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now we're really beginning to see the impact of what the fall has done. And, and just so we all are on the same page. What is in Adam and in Eve that we're reading about tonight, that is in all of us. Whether you're saved or not, that's in you. The same tendencies, the same, uh, the same reaction that we have to our personal uh, sin, our a reaction that we have to God, those tendencies, we may not act on them, but those tendencies are there. It says, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And God would probably, no doubt, have come down to fellowship with them on a daily basis. Uh, and no doubt, when he, they heard his voice, like little children, they would run to God. And they would enjoy that time of fellowship together. But now the sin has entered into the picture. It says Adam and his wife hid themselves. They, they hid from God. Now that will show God immediately, okay, something's wrong in the garden. Something has happened. But it shows us on the part of uh, Adam and Eve, first, because of their sin, they felt, I've got to cover myself. I have to hide myself. Give me the fig leaves. I have to hide myself. But when the, they came into the presence of God, suddenly they became aware the fig leaves are not enough. We have to go hide in the, in the garden. See, and that's what sin does to us. Sin makes you hide and hide and hide. And all of us, the human race, we're so clever. We're so deceptive that we can even deceive ourselves, and as we're hiding behind fig leaves and behind trees and behind lies and behind deceits, we, we say we put on like everything's okay, but we're hiding from the presence of the Lord. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. So now you have to see Adam and Eve. If you can imagine, they've covered themselves, they've draped aprons of fig leaves uh, over themselves, uh, and they're They've run into the garden, they've run in amongst the trees, and they're hiding behind the trees, hiding from God. Now, God is omniscient. It means that anything that is knowable, he already, he already knows it, past, present, and future. He knows all things. So he knows exactly what has happened. He knows exactly where they're at. He knows the, very, uh, the, the intent of their hearts. He's fully aware of it. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now, as I said, God knows everything. He, he didn't have to ask Adam, where are you? God already knew where he was at. He knew exactly which tree he was hiding behind. But he asked this question to provoke Adam. To provoke Adam to ask himself the question, where am I at? I, I used to would run to the Father. I would used to run and enjoy our time of fellowship. Now I'm running in the opposite direction. And this is the voice of a, a heartbroken father for, for his children. This is not a judge that come in, where are you at, Adam? No, it's Adam, where are you, son? Where are you at? 
And Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden. And he mentions three things. He says, number one, I was afraid. Number two, I was naked. And number three, I hid myself. I was afraid because I was naked. And, and based on that, I hid myself uh, amongst the trees. He mentioned all of the symptoms, but he didn't mention the fact that I have sinned. He, he doesn't mention anything about his sin. He mentions all the symptoms and all of the, the outcomes of his sin, but he doesn't mention his sin. Again, the same tendencies are in all of us. It, it sometimes it's very difficult for us to admit, I'm broken. I, I, got, I, got, some, I got some brokenness in, in me. How many can just admit that tonight? But we, we, all got, we all got issues, and thank God we have the Holy Spirit that helps us. But Adam mentioned uh, him being afraid. He mentioned him being naked. He mentioned him hiding himself, but he does not mention his sin. He doesn't mention the fact that I have disobeyed the one commandment that you gave me. And he, the Lord, said, who told thee thou wast naked? Now, again, God knows exactly what happened. He's asking these questions for the benefit of Adam. Because uh, God would have immediately recognized the fact, Adam, you responded to me uh, where you're at, but you didn't mention, you said everything else, but you didn't mention sin. And so he's given him another shot, another chance. Okay, how'd you find that out? Who told you that you were naked? Because he had been naked from the day that he was created. And now suddenly he has a different viewpoint of his nakedness that he's ever had prior to that. And some theologians think that it was probably only about 40 days that they had been in the garden, less than 40 days that they had been in the garden before this event happened. Uh, 40 is the number of probation. Uh, and there's no way you can really tell whether or not that number is right, but we know they, that they fell into sin before Eve had her first child. So we know that that probably would have been fairly quick. Um, so the Lord says, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree wherefore I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Boom. There it is. Have you sinned, Adam? Have you disobeyed my commandment? You know, the beautiful thing about when we come to God, we can just come to God because he don't tell nobody. You can just put it right there. You can just lay it out. You can just be as honest as you can possibly be because he won't, he's not put off. He had to bring Adam to this place. Adam would not come here by himself. He had to directly ask him, have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you that you should not eat of it? It's a yes, no question trying to bring Adam to the place that he would just confess uh, his sin. Who told thee thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Wherefore I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat. And the man said, the woman. The man said, the woman whom thou hast given, who thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Now again, we, we look at Adam and we look how he reacts. Don't put that far away from yourself because that's in us. So finally, God says, exactly, just ask him straight up. Have you eaten of the tree I told you not to eat? The man said, the woman. It's all her fault. The woman, and matter of fact, the woman, God, who you gave me. If you had not gave me her, this would not have happened to me. <laughs> You know, it's easy to blame it on somebody else. You know, that's what's happening in our society now. Everything, no matter what the issue is, is someone else's fault. I'm the only one that's clear. Everybody else has got issues. But the reality is all of us have issues. And the more that we can be real and admit our brokenness, the more that God has latitude uh, to help us in our lives. The man said, the woman, he just threw Eve under the bus. <laughs> He, he, just, he just tried to put it all. Has anybody ever done that before in your own life? You know, we got that tendency. You want to, somebody else's problem. The man said, the woman who thou gavest me, meaning that he uh, brought somewhat of a reproach on God himself, you gave it to me. That's, that's the problem. You gave it to me, God. This is your, it's your fault. You did this. 
she gave me of the tree and I did eat. So he finally admits that he ate of the forbidden fruit, but he's added all type of other variables and circumstance to try to minimize the impact of his sin. She gave it to me and I did eat. Now at this point, God is looking through. I'm not sure what's going on. Could we lay that, that fob up on the thing? I think I'm missing it. Uh, so at this point, God has just said, okay, that's it. I, that, that's all I'm going to get out of Adam. He, he's, lie, he's putting lie on top of lie. And have you ever noticed, and I won't ask for a show of hands, but when you do something wrong, when, when you allow sin to somehow come in your life, you immediately have to make a deception to cover the sin. <laughs> and then sometimes you have to put another deception on that one because it wasn't enough. And, and so when the fig leaves are not enough, you hide behind the trees of the garden and, and, you keep, and, and sin adds to sin where well, you just hide and hide and hide. And the Lord God finally, he said to the woman, he just left Adam alone. He just stopped talking to Adam. Let me go over here and talk to the woman. And the Lord said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Now, you'll notice that he did not give the, the woman, he didn't give her the opportunity to lie the way that Adam did. He just came straight to her and said, what have you done? What, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, just like Adam, it was the serpent. So if you can see, it's almost like a cartoon where you have a, uh, Adam pointing at the woman and the woman and she's pointing at the serpent. And those are only three in the garden. And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me. And I did eat. And the Lord said unto the serpent. Uh, uh, let, me, let me slow down. At this point, God is aware of everything that happened. When he came into the garden, he was already aware of everything that happened. But he allowed Adam to show himself, to show his, the, the impact of the fall, uh, mentioning everything other than his sin. And then when he finally got asked specifically about his sin, he pointed and blamed it on the woman and blamed it on God. And then he talks to the woman and she, she blames it on the serpent. And so now he's ready to deal with the issue. The Lord said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this. Notice he asked the serpent not one question. He, he didn't ask him, okay, why did you do this? How did this? He didn't ask him anything. He said, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. And above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So the Lord is now handing out punishments for this treachery uh, against his righteousness and against his command. And he begins with the serpent, and, and he'll move uh, backwards to Adam. But he tells the serpent, because you have done this, you beguiled Eve, and you, uh, you seduced her in ways, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now, for it to be a curse, he, he, he cursed the serpent and said to the serpent, you will crawl on your belly all the days of your life. For that to be a curse, it means that the serpent had to not be crawling on his belly previous to the curse. Otherwise, it's not a curse. So there are many scholars that think that the serpent probably either had legs like a lizard or may, as, may actually have walked upright. We know the serpent was able to speak. We know that he was able to give uh, verbiage to communicate the temptation to Eve in, 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 in detail. So the serpent was very unlike what we see serpents as today. Uh, but the curse again is that uh, upon thy belly shall thy go and dust shall thy eat all the days of thy life. Now I want you to remember that last phrase. We're going to come back to it. The curse on the serpent was, dust shall thy eat all the days of thy life. Keep that in mind as we move forward. He continues to curse the serpent and say, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. 
And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now immediately, I mean immediately, the fall has just happened. God is already prophesying what is going to take place 6,000 years later. Because he's making the first reference to the coming Messiah. This is the first reference to Jesus Christ uh, in the Bible. He says, I'll put enmity between thee, the serpent, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Now, we know that her seed is Messiah, uh, who came through the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the way down to Jesus Christ. It, it is up in the air what is said concerning the seed of the serpent. We, we, ju we, we just don't really know what is the seed of the serpent. Is it all those that uh, fall away, all those that reject God's redemption plan? We, we don't know. But the last sentence says, It, the seed of the woman, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And this is what happened on the cross. Um, Jesus' heel was bruised, the the. the beating, the, the punishment he took on the cross was equivalent to his heel being bruised, but it was a, a death blow to the head of Satan. It was a death blow to Satan's kingdom. So again, this is the first uh, symbolism pointing forward to the cross, which occurs immediately after the fall. So that's it for the serpent. He comes to the woman now. And, and incidentally, at this point, Eve does not have a name. She has not been named yet. She's only called the woman. She's called the helper. She, there, there's no reference. She has not yet been given a name. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And thy desire shall be unto thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, this first, um, this first part of the curse uh, involves childbirth. Um, and they tell me it, it's, it's, it's pretty difficult. <laughs> that, so they tell me when Shekinah, uh, when she had uh, my, my granddaughter, uh, she, she was trying to explain to me, she's saying it's such a dark place, uh, you, you have to hold on to God. That's the only way you can come out of it. And, of course, she had a, a natural childbirth. Uh, which, which, it is what it is. Uh, <laughs> but it's amazing to me the, the, the words that God uses here. He says, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. I, I don't know that I've ever met a mother that says, yeah, I would use the word sorrow to describe natural childbirth, sorrow. It, they, they tend to use a word that's much, much more tragic than just sorrow. Sorrow means like, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little sorrowful. But it, it, from what I've, I've understood, it's, it's more like a torment. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit here, and here's what I'm leading up to. The Holy Spirit here used the word sorrow to represent the anguish of childbirth. In the book of Revelation concerning those who take the mark of the beast, he says that their torment, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And that word torment uh, in the book of Revelation, it really is torture. Now, now if, if childbirth is just sorrow, my God, torture is going to be, a, uh, that's going to be something nobody wants to be involved in. That's going to be something nobody wants any impact from. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Simply meaning that uh, the desire of the woman is towards her husband. Um, but more specifically, that in the eyes of God, the husband is it's not the scripture. Nowhere does the scripture ever say the husband is the head of the house. That is not in your Bible. What's in your Bible is that the husband is the head of the wife. I look it up. And this is God's creation order. This is how God put the family together so that the husband is the head of the wife. The, hu the husband and the wife together manage the children. 
uh, and they are to work together in unison. You know, it, it's a horrible thing when you have these marriages and, and, they're just, and they're just fighting. They're just pulling and pushing and everybody's trying to get a superiority over the other one. That's not what God had planned. That's not the way that God wanted it. He says plainly here, he, Adam, shall rule over thee. And unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree, which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And so this, this first part of this curse, this earth is able to produce much more in terms of food uh, and plants than it does right now. This curse limited the productivity of, of the planet, uh, limited how much it can grow. Now, right now, the world can grow enough food to, to feed every person on the planet many times over. The problem is that men will not put the money forth to distribute the food from the places that grow it to the places that don't grow it as well. And so, but the planet is still makes enough food for all, all 7 billion of us uh, to eat, but it's man's inhumanity to man that allows famines and allows uh, this type of thing to happen. It's not on the point, a part of God. But he said that the earth would bring forth less uh, than it did. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow thou shalt eat of it, meaning that now the, uh, everything used to would just grow, but now you got to plow, plow you got to sow, you got to reap, you have to work by the sweat of your brow to, to uh, cultivate uh, the food. The curse goes on to say, thorns also and thistles shall it bring to thee, bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the land. So it is at this point that the rose bush began to have thorns. It's at this point that we start seeing nauseous plants uh, sticky plants that have thorns and, and prickles on them. They were not there prior to the fall because remember, God, Eden was a garden. It was a paradise. There was no inclement weather prior to the fall. There weren't hurricanes and tornadoes. As a matter of fact, when you look at the big cats, the, the big panthers and tigers, they didn't have those large carnivorous fangs in their mouth because they were plant eaters. They didn't eat meat. It was only after the fall that nature was so impacted, it was so twisted out of the proportions that God had originally created it, that now the, the rose bush, as beautiful as it is, you have to be careful because it has thorns. Those thorns are there because of the fall. It's because of the fall. The noxious plants, the weeds, the milkweed, and all of that, those things are not consistent with paradise, but we have them now, now as a result of the fall. God goes on to say, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, meaning until you die. For out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Now here's something that uh, you'll remember that I, I told you to, to remember that he, he told the serpent, upon thy belly shall I go all the days of thy life, and, and dust will you eat. And now he turns around to Adam and says, Adam, you're dust. And so what that tells us is that when Adam was actually made from the dust, he was made from the red clay. And whenever we walk in that base nature, when we live at, our, at that lowest element, not walking in the spirit, but walking just in the flesh, in that baseness, the devil has God's permission to eat us up. If we're living in the dust, if we're walking in the dust, God said, you're going to eat dust all the days of your life, serpent. And he's given him permission to devour us, which is why it, we have to always, no matter what you do, stay spiritual. It puts you out of the dust. It puts you out of the realm where Satan can uh, steal, kill, and destroy. And Adam calls his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So Adam named his wife. Here's what it means to, to from, this, from that time until this. It means that women have to be very, very careful who you marry. 
Because much of your identity will come from your husband. Much of your identity, you can't just because he got pretty hair, that's not enough. Uh, I, I, I'm thinking about, I won't say any names, but I'm thinking about one person that was uh, courting and was thinking about uh, getting married. Um, and she said, well, we're going to have to check your credit. We need to know where your credit's at. And you think, wow, that's too far. No, you should do that. You said, how's your credit looking? And you need to make a decision because you can put yourself in the poorhouse by just marrying the wrong person. But, but you're going to receive much of your identity from your husband, especially as long as Sister Lincoln and I have been married, what, 40 some years now. Uh, I, sometimes Sister Lincoln can make a face and I realize that she got that face from me. <laughs> she's seen me make it for so long that she's picked it up because it communicates between us without words. But we see here very clearly that it was Adam uh, who named his wife. I want to just read something here from my notes. Um, up until this point, as I said earlier, the woman had never been called Eve, uh, but actually it's Adam who gave her uh, her name in this scripture. She had previously been called the helper or the, um, or the female or the woman. Oh, here it is. A woman gains more of her identity from her husband than the man does from the wife. For this reason, women should take special care in which man they marry. And Adam also, uh, unto Adam also, and unto his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins. Now this is the first sacrifice in the Bible. This is the first symbolism of the shed blood of Jesus Christ that you're going to find in the Bible. And we're just right outside the fall. The fall just happened, and immediately God's looking 6,000 uh, years down the road, and he sees, I've got to start laying the blueprint for my redemption plan. And it says that um, unto Adam also and unto his wife, the Lord God made coats of skin. So God did the first sacrifice, meaning that he took one or more little animals you cannot take the coat of skin off of an animal without killing the animal and shedding the blood. So he took the coats of skin off to give a covering. The, the physical coat of skin gave a physical covering to Adam and Eve. But the shed blood of that little animal gave a blood covering for their sin. Lest God destroy them on, on the spot. And that's the, that's the first sacrifice until it was put into uh, practice by, by the patriarchs, and they would offer up for their own personal sin, they would offer up a sacrifice. These little animal, innocent, these little innocent animals died so blood could be shed to cover Adam and Eve's sin. We see it right out of the garden. It clothed them. Now, here's a good point, uh, because... You know, we live in a, a, a society now that people just wear anything. I mean, just, just anything. Well, Adam and Eve had on fig leaves. They had on fig leaves. But that wasn't sufficient for God. He wanted them clothed better than fig leaves. And so he made them the first garments, the coats of skin, to cover their nakedness. So we can't come all the way down 6,000 years later and say, God doesn't care, just whatever you, he does care. We see that he cares here, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we have to, we have to be very careful in the way that we adorn ourselves uh, because we're fallen creation. <laughs> you know, if the fall hadn't happened, then, you know, may, maybe we'd have a, a covering of, of glory. But the fall has happened. And so we have to be very careful how we present ourselves to the world. I was speaking with my daughter a couple of days ago, and she gave me this wonderful thought. You know, we are ambassadors for Christ. How many have heard that before? You're an ambassador for Christ. She gave me this thought that when the ambassador of Saudi Arabia comes to the United States, he don't wear our clothes. He wears the clothes from where he, his government's at. He doesn't speak our language. He puts that little thing on his ear in the United Nations and he speaks his language. 
And if we're ambassadors from heaven, we shouldn't be rushing to put on the world's clothes. Now, we know that whatever we put on was made down here, but we shouldn't be on the bleeding edge of the fashion thing because it, it's, it's fairly corrupt at that point now. Um, so if we're ambassadors for Christ, we should, we should uh, realize God made a better clothing for them because he wants us to wear something to cover our shame. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So God is speaking, the, the Godhead now is speaking, the triune Godhead is now speaking, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. That's who the us is. Behold, the man has become uh, as one of us, to know good and evil. And let me explain what this little phrase means. It's not that God didn't want Adam to know, but the good and evil that Adam had now uh, ensconced in, within himself was different than the good and evil of God's moral code. Are you with me? See, we, we think things are good, like I, I mentioned earlier, legalized love. We think, you know what, we, we need to have planned parenthood. That's a good thing. You know, we'll help families plan their parenthood and plan financially how, how, you know, when they're going to have children and all that. And that's a good thing. But, but in the eyes of God, killing babies is never a good thing. And so man has his own view of what is good and his own view of what is evil and is, is different and opposed to what God says is good and what God says. This is what the renewing of the mind is all about, is moving from what our knowledge of good and evil and coming to God's knowledge of good and evil. And how many know sometimes God can tell you something and you don't really agree with it? I know I'm not the only one. I remember years ago when we didn't have this church, we were in the storefront, we had just had land here and there's a big ditch in the middle. Uh, and I remember I was out here working on the property and uh, there was some wood on the property. So I just threw it over into the ditch. I thought, well, that's not gonna hurt anything. And God made me go down that ditch and get that wood out because the ditch didn't belong to us. I just threw it in the other man's <laughs> ditch. And you, you think, well, that's not that big of a deal. But it's because our good and evil is different than God's good and evil. I remember another time I was on the property and I had a piece of gum or candy or something. I just threw the paper on the ground. And God, the Holy Ghost, made me go get that paper. And he doesn't let me litter at all now. I have to, I have to put it in my pocket <laughs> until I get somewhere to, to throw it away. But, you know, many times you can think, well, wow, that's, you, you know, the God of glory is concerned about a little piece of litter. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, he is. And so we think sometimes it's not a big deal, but God is saying, yeah, it is a big deal. For example, uh, you can look at it this way. You got this whole paradise, this whole garden. You got fruit dangling from trees everywhere. And I, I could eat some over here and eat some over here. What's the big deal? I just eat this one too. But that's the one that God said, don't eat that one. And we can think that, well, it's not that big of a deal. But God says, yeah, that is a big deal. Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. In other words, he's saying, Adam, you can't be in paradise anymore. You got to leave, bro. You, you got to go. Now, we look at that and it's like, you know, we, we think, oh, well, that was somewhat of a punishment, but this is really the grace of God. And if we look back at the prior slide, he says, here's the reasoning that God has done this, lest he put forth his hand and take also, also of the tree of life. Meaning that he's already put forth his hand and taken of the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He has now ensconced within himself this knowledge. Now, we got to stop him because if he gets to the tree of life, that brokenness that you and I have in us, we would have that in us throughout eternity. It, it, would, it would never go away. Incidentally, 
That brokenness that you have in your personality, that all of us have, that I have in my personality, the sanctification works on it. He makes it better and better. But as soon as you pull back this layer of, of, of broken personality, underneath it you find another layer. And so as long as you're in that physical body, the Holy Spirit will be working on you, trying to bring you up to the measure of Jesus Christ. If Adam had a partook of, the, uh, of, of the, uh, the tree of life, all of us would live eternally. For eons and eons, as the ages rolled out one after another, we would live with that brokenness in us throughout eternity future. The only way you can stop being broke, you got to die. <laughs> that, that's, that's the only way. When you leave this body... The brokenness stays in this body if you're, if you're saved, if you're blood washed. So he says that uh, now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden to till the ground from whence he was taken. He, he evicted him. He said, Adam, all the work that I've done here in this garden is no longer yours. You, you have to leave. So... He drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims with a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, understand, it's not so much that God doesn't want him in the garden. God does not want him to take part of the tree of life. And it's already obvious he can't just say, Adam, don't eat from this tree because he's already failed at that test. So he has to reinforce and make sure that you've already corrupted yourself, that you don't lock in that corruption throughout eternity future. So he drove out the man. This word drove in the Hebrew is equivalent to, being, to casting out. The way that Jesus would cast out devils, he thrust the man out of the garden. He, he, he expelled him from the garden. And he placed him in the east of the Garden of Eden, Oh, he placed in the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, which are angelic beings, and a flaming sword which turned every way. Now, no one seems to know very much about, uh, in terms of commentators that I've read after, exactly what the flaming sword is. But, but we can deduce this, that God was willing to use violence, if necessary, to keep Adam out of the garden. That, that flaming sword is there to let you know, don't, don't do it, because this angel has orders to stop you from coming back in here, um, which turned every way to keep, the, here's the motivation, to keep the way of the tree of life. That, that's what God did not want Adam to get to. And incidentally, when you go all the way to the book of Revelation and you see uh, the new Jerusalem come down to this planet and you see the river of life come from the threshold of God and run throughout that city, there are trees of life on, all, on both sides of that river all the way down. Not one tree of life, tree of, trees of life on both sides of that river all the way down and they give their fruit every month. Every month you get fruit from that tree. Um, so, so it's not that God did not want us to have the tree of life. It's that he was protecting us so that we don't go through an entire eternity being separated from him and having this brokenness, this awful brokenness in us. I, I'm going to stop right here. This is going to be our last chapter. Chapter 4 is going to be our last chapter, and I, I think I've only got about 14 slides in it. So that'll give us enough that we have a, a full service uh, next week. So we're going to stop just a little bit early tonight. I hope that you're getting something out of this. I hope that uh, maybe you're seeing some things you've not seen before uh, in your own study. Um, but we'll pick up with chapter 4 uh, on, on next week. Amen. Brother Ike, would you take our offering, please? Amen. Amen. Thank you for that, Pastor. Um, you know, just thinking about the scripture, uh, man has become like us and he knows good and evil. But what's the point of knowing if you don't have the power and the wisdom to actually, you know, navigate it? So just thank God that we have the, the full picture 
you know, and we have Christ because if we don't, man, uh, we could be stuck in our sin forever. So uh, with that being said, um, please go ahead and get ready to uh, take up your offering and tithe. Um, if you're going to give online, um, scroll down to the bottom and click the donate button. Um, and you can also text to give. Uh, that should be on the screen as well. And um, if you have cash or check, um, you can go ahead and drop it in the offering basket in the back. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and ask for all to rise as I uh, pray over the offering and dismiss us. Father, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you for today. We thank you uh, for the word, Father. We thank you for just everyone having a chance to come out and just sit at your table, Father, and learn from you, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the funds that are being placed in the hands of this ministry, God, because we know, Father, that this ministry truly, truly has a heart to do your will, Father. Father, we just give you all the praise and glory. We thank you that we are not left in our sin, God. We thank you that you made a way, Father, through your son, Father. And we thank you, Father, that the sin of Adam and Eve did not catch you off guard, oh God, because you had a way, Father, from the start. God, we just thank you, and we ask that your presence go with us as we go throughout the week, Father. All these things we ask and pray in your mighty name. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for watching and please subscribe. You can also find more of our videos in our archives at ChristUnveiled.org. We'll see you next time.